murderers named Mark. Arizona versus Mark Gooch. This trial took us into a Mennonite community where a young woman, Sasha Kraus, was part of the Farmington Mennonite Church in New Mexico. Mark Gooch was raised in a Mennonite family but never formally joined the church. He left the community to join the military, something that is strictly disallowed in the Mennonite faith, and he left with a grudge. The cause of his bitterness was never explicitly explained. There was only a brief mention that he felt differently than those who were born and raised Mennonite. As his family was not born into the faith, Mark felt that they were treated like outsiders. Mennonites do not practice shunning, so his malice was not related to treatment when he left the community. Mark's grudge led him to conduct quote-unquote surveillance of Mennonites until he found Sasha alone one night. He didn't know her. They'd never met. This is one of those statistical anomalies, a victim outside a perpetrator's circle. She was missing for over a month, from January 18th to February 21st, and was sadly found in a field in Flagstaff, Arizona. Mark was discovered through cell phone records. He did not testify at his trial, but incredible cell phone tracking tech essentially testified for him. It was like nothing I've ever seen pinpointing him within a matter of feet. Mark's brother, Samuel, was arrested for tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution. He worked in IT and did his best to remotely delete as much of Mark's potentially damning information as he could. He also flew to Arizona to get the gun used by Mark. What he didn't know is that it had already been seized, and the one he took was a nearly identical plant. Samuel testified at Mark's trial. He was not thrilled to be there. He had to read aloud text messages between Mark and him, wherein they made reference to the Mennonite church being a cult. As a woman in a more conservative Mennonite community, Sasha wore a head covering at all times. When she was found, her head covering was missing, having been taken by Mark Gooch. Florida versus Mark Seavers. Mark Seavers hired his best friend, Curtis Wayne Wright, who then hired his unhinged friend, Jimmy Rogers, to help him take out Mark's wife, Dr. Teresa Seavers. Mark and Curtis believed that their highly encrypted code for when to use their burner phones was infallible. They weren't like other criminals. When it was time for the two of them to plan the deed, they took it very seriously. I'll try to explain how it went down, but you'll have to listen very, very carefully. It gets complicated. Okay, so one of them would get the regular cell phone. That person would then open their text messaging application to send a coded text message to the other person's text messaging application. Now, you must understand that no one else had access to their cipher. So even if someone did see their text messages, it would naturally go over their head, never to be understood by anyone but Mark and Curtis. The code word for when to switch over from regular cell phones to their burner phones was the word other. I know, this is where things go from intense to mind blowing. Sometimes they would text the phrase, use other, but hang on, it gets better on especially clever days. You know, the days where you just feel all of the brain's magnificence and you know that the world is your oyster. Well, on those days, Mark and Curtis went all out and used the mother of all codes, brother from an other mother. Consider the genius level investigation techniques necessary to decode this virtually untranslatable message between these two. But it happened. Mark and Curtis formed their plan, which would take place when Teresa got home, alone, while Mark and their two daughters were out of state. Curtis and Jimmy the Hammer, that's not sarcastic, he really called himself that, drove into town and dressed in head-to-toe body coverings to ensure that no evidence would be left behind. If there's a positive in the story, it's that the children were not there at the time 
and the last memories they have of their loving mother were happy. Curtis Wayne Wright took a lesser sentence to testify against Mark and Jimmy. It was incredibly awkward watching Mark while Curtis testified. He wrote frantically the entire time, avoiding any kind of eye contact. Between crying without tears, blowing his nose with the driest sound ever made, and never looking up at his lifelong best friend, it was probably a party for any behavioral analysts who watched the trial. Florida versus Markeith Lloyd. I know his name isn't exactly Mark, but I'm going with it. If there's ever been a self-proclaimed victim in every way possible, it's Markeith Lloyd. Sade Dixon was a pregnant mother of two. December 13, 2016, Markeith went to her house and, according to him, his pregnant ex-girlfriend attacked him and he had to defend himself with bullets, eight of them. He also had to defend himself against Sade's brother, who was trying to protect his sister from those bullets. On the run for a month, Markeith was minding his own business, strolling through a Walmart when someone recognized him and alerted a police officer who was also in the store. Master Sergeant Deborah Clayton called for backup and approached Markeith. He ran. She yelled for him to stop running, and he had no choice but to defend himself against her with a bullet. Then, he had no choice but to stand over her while she was wounded on the ground and defend himself again, three more times, until she was no longer living. Another officer saw, and Markeith had to defend himself again with two shots at that officer. Furthermore, if you think he had a choice to not carjack someone's VW Passat, you'd be wrong. Markeith hid for nine days during a manhunt for him. He wore body armor and had two loaded guns. He wildly resisted arrest because, in his words, he doesn't trust cops. And he lost his eye in the process. In his first court appearance, he denied that he was Markeith Lloyd. Markeith testified during his trials, and wow, does he talk without restraint. I have no clue why he thought it'd be a good idea to testify, but it was clear that no one was going to convince him otherwise. For the sake of the lives he took, and for the sake of their devastated loved ones, I'm so glad he did testify, though. He described in detail how he respects women, how he treated Sade like a queen, and how the most important thing is to bring as many babies into the world as possible. There are people who do terrible things, but who you can empathize with, because empathy does not mean condone. Then there's Markeith. Two beautiful women, mothers, lost their lives, and the best that Markeith could offer was ranting about how he did nothing wrong, the unfairness of life, self-absorbed arrogance, and not even an adjacent twinge of an apology. Deborah Clayton was posthumously promoted from Master Sergeant to Lieutenant, and her handcuffs were used when Markeith Lloyd was finally arrested. Colorado versus Mark Redwine. Mark Redwine was responsible for the loss of his son, 13-year-old Dylan, it's difficult to think of the circumstances around this. It's overused to say that it was unnecessary, but it's never been truer than this case. Dylan had a mom who loved him and who would have kept him if not for forced visitation. Now, I understand court-ordered visitation, but sometimes a parent, or even both parents, will utilize their visitation not because of love for their children, but because of malice for their ex. Mark Redwine was a mess. Dylan did not want to be with him, and he had uncovered disturbing pictures of his dad that made him even more uncomfortable. Dylan should have been able to stay with his mom, but that didn't happen, and now he's gone. Corey, Dylan's brother, did a great job testifying against their dad, but I couldn't bring myself to watch the whole trial. I tried. I just couldn't get past the feces. I'm sorry. If you can handle it, you've got a tougher stomach than me. This case of filicide could be summarized as heartbreaking, selfish, and disgusting.